license? License under uh, CC license, and it's available also electronically, right? Yes. Yeah. For like uh, 99 cents. An amazing price of 99 cents. I mean, <laughs> when was the last time you bought anything for 99 cents? One third the price of the Diet Snapple. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a free PDF actually on my website too. Very good. 99 cents is too much. If that'll break your bank, go and steal the free PDF. All right, guys, let's do the talk. Thanks, Puneet. Uh, thanks to Creative Commons for inviting me to this talk. And thank you to Samir and SFSU for hosting us here on this campus. Uh, and thanks to everybody for showing up and sacrificing uh, a little bit of your time before your Friday evening festivities. Uh, enjoy the weekend. So I want to begin with a story that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's a story about a silversmith living in colonial America who made a famous ride on the night of April 18, 1775. The ride began in Charleston, Massachusetts, and ended up in Lexington some 13 miles away, lasting approximately two hours and ending near midnight. And of course, this famous ride of Paul Revere has become the subject of legends. So everybody knows one if by land, two if by... Excellent. The British are coming, the British are coming. As the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote, so through the night rode Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm. A cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. Now there's a small problem with this famous account. It's not true. As the Pulitzer Prize winning historian David Hackett, Hacker, Hackett Fisher wrote, this romantic idea about Paul Revere's ride is etched indelibly upon national memory, but it is not what actually happened that night. Many other writers helped Paul Revere to carry the alarm. And even more important than debunking the myth surrounding Paul Revere's ride, Professor Fisher goes on in his book to describe precisely why the American system of communication was so effective that night in sounding the alarm about the incoming British troops. As Professor Fisher describes it, the American system was a decentralized network. It was a network that was coordinated through an openly disorderly network of Congresses and, and committees, but it had no central authority. It enlisted its churches and ministers, its physicians and lawyers, its family networks and voluntary associations. If we depicted this network of the American system of communication at that time, it would look something like this, with Paul Revere tapping into the existing communities of Massachusetts and others doing the same as well. Now, of course, this is just a simulation. It's not the scale, but I think you get the picture of how Mich uh, Massachusetts looked like back then. Now, I want to take some liberties for today's talk and characterize what you've just seen as a Revere-style network. It was a network that worked from the bottom up to mobilize people quickly, at least quickly for that time period. So the Midnight Riders and Paul Revere were able to tap into the local groups and communities, and then the people in those communities were able to sound the alarm about the incoming British troops. And they did so in whatever way they could think of. Bells, guns, drums, or the proverbial lantern in the church tower. And then this mobilized the American militia, which scored an important first victory at the battles of Lexington and Concord at the start of the American Revolution. And this system of communication that America had was in complete contrast to the one that Britain had in America. The British system was completely centralized in America. If we mapped the British system, it would look like this, a top-down model, or like this, with General Thomas Gage sending a message to one other member of the British Army. And of course, if the message did not find its way to the recipient, the message was lost. And that actually happened at a crucial moment before the battles of Lexington and Concord. Now, some of you may be wondering, what does this lesson of American history have to do with the fight for the future of the internet? Well, if you bear with me for a couple more minutes, I hope to connect the dots. So fast forward now to January 18th, 2012. We're almost at the two-year anniversary of this historic event, when we saw the largest internet blackout in history, perhaps best symbolized by this image of Wikipedia blacking out, all of its English language pages for all of its entries for a full 24 hours around the world. 
Imagine a world without free knowledge. And Wikipedia wasn't the only one. Google blacked out its logo for the first time ever. Reddit, the social news sharing site, blacked out. Mozilla, the maker of Firefox. Craigslist. Wired Magazine. WordPress blogs. Over 115,000 websites blacked out in a form of self-censorship to protest and to sound the alarm about SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, which was Congress's latest and greatest efforts to combat online piracy of copyrighted content. And though SOPA had numerous provisions, the most controversial provision of all was a provision that would have allowed the Attorney General of the United States to go to court and based on a simple showing of probable cause that some foreign website out there was engaged in criminal copyright infringement, based on that simple showing, get a court order to direct internet service providers in the United States to cut off the domain name of that foreign website from its IP address so that nobody could find it in the United States. Essentially kind of like having your phone number disconnected based on a simple showing of probable cause. And internet activists and people in the internet community fear that there were so few procedural safeguards in this provision that the, inevitably there would be collateral damage of legitimate sites being taken down. Nonetheless, this had the widespread support of the entertainment industry, which spent $91 million in support of SOPA just by the date of the first hearing in the House Judiciary Committee. This had a who's who's list of Hollywood studios, media conglomerates, and multinational corporations supporting SOPA. So not surprisingly, the way that our politics works, there was widespread support for SOPA in Congress. 32 co-sponsors of the bill in the House, and even more in the Senate, 42 co-sponsors in the Senate, which is nearly half the Senate wanted their names attached to the bill as sponsors. Remarkable. And even beyond the sponsors, it had strong bipartisan support. So it was fair to say that when it was first introduced in October of 2011, SOPA was a slam dunk to pass. Indeed, it may have been on the fast track to being passed by the end of that year. But then something remarkable happened the day after the blackout, January 19th. SOPA had become toxic. It had become a four-letter word. Nobody wanted to be associated with it any longer. And if we look at the numbers of uh, opponents the day after, it had tripled in a 24-hour period. And for the first time in the entire debate, there were more opponents to SOPA than supporters. And in fact, some of the co-sponsors ended up opposing the bill they sponsored. It was kind of crazy. So one of them was Senator Barker Rubio of Florida, who's touted to be one of the future presidential candidates of the Republican Party even in the upcoming 2016 election, he said on his Facebook page the day of the blackout, we must protect the free and open access to the internet, and SOPA was a threat. The same SOPA that he co-sponsored, he now opposed. Likewise, Chris Dodd, the chairman of the Motion Picture Association of America, and the former senator, said to the New York Times the day after the blackout, this is altogether a new effect. And he said that he hadn't seen anything like this in his 40 years of politics, when something that had so much support had quickly changed to so much opposition in such a short amount of time. And he likened this to the Arab Spring, where we saw Middle Eastern countries protest, and in some cases have political revolutions, in part facilitated by organization through Facebook and Twitter. Now my view is that Senator Dodd is not entirely correct, what we saw on January 18th is similar to what we saw on April 18th, 1775. In both cases, we had a Revere-style network, a decentralized network that helped people sound the alarm. But instead of horses, we now have websites to help people sound the alarm and to mobilize people quickly from the bottom up. And if we look at some of the numbers from that day, they're quite staggering. So millions of people voiced their opposition. Eight million people looked up the Congress members' contact information on a directory that Wikipedia had created remarkably in 48 hours. They had worked round the clock for 48 hours straight to get this directory set up, 
And that caused some of the websites of the senators to crash because so many people were trying to contact their senators on that day. Likewise, 10 million people signed petitions to Congress against SOPA. 7 million of those petitions, uh, signatures were uh, garnered by Google's petition through its blackout page. 3 million people sent emails to Congress through various internet nonprofits' websites. And over 100,000 people made phone calls to Congress that day. And even though that number is the smallest number, that number may be the most important number. Because as Representative Zoe Lofgren of Silicon Valley continually advised the opposition to SOPA, you need to melt the phone lines in order to make an impact in Congress. The human voice has a greater impact than any petition and any email. It's just something so simple as the analog of having uh, the human voice expressed uh, to your member of Congress. And eyewitnesses in Congress that day said, the phones were ringing off the hook uh, in members of Congress uh, offices uh, because so many people were calling about SOPA. It really hadn't happened before. And if we look at other analytics from that day, everything is off the charts. So Google searches for SOPA on January 18th peaked. On a scale of 100 for Google Analytics, it hit the 100 mark. It's as high as you can go. For Twitter, there were 3.5% of all tweets that day were related to SOPA. And for a copyright professor, that's just unbelievable to have so many people talking about SOPA, so many members of the public talking about SOPA. It was incredible. And if we map the universe of tweets that day, it looks something like this. And this is a map that Fred Berenson worked on to map the dialogue on Twitter related to SOPA. So who were the people receiving the most tweets related to SOPA? Well, it was some of the key players involved in the political debate. So the blue on this chart represents more tweets received. The green represents more tweets sent out that day. And at the top, there's the White House. In the middle, there's Representative uh, Lamar Smith, the chief sponsor of SOPA. And at the bottom here in the blue is Representative Daryl Issa, the chief opponent of SOPA in the House Judiciary Committee. And even Kim Kardashian got involved in this fight. So she tweeted out, you must stop SOPA and keep the web open and free. And she provided a link to Wikipedia's blacked out page, which also had a link to frequently asked questions about SOPA. And a funny anecdote is one of the internet activists from the Electronic Frontier Foundation said, when he saw Kardashian's tweet, that's the moment he realized they, meaning the opposition, had won. He had been working on this from the start, back in October of 2011, and this was like the validation, the first time when he felt their message had finally trickled out to the masses, and now even Kardashian was involved in this fight and on their side against SOPA. So not surprisingly, two days later, after the blackout, SOPA was shelled, and it hasn't come back ever since. In fact, SOPA is, as I said before, a four-letter word. If you have another SOPA, members of Congress want to flee from it because they don't want the uh, stigma attached to that sort of negative bill. Now, I think this is an incredible story of civic engagement. Really, we had never seen anything like this in our 200-plus years of copyright policy when so many people in the public got involved in a debate over a copyright law. And if this were the only story to tell, I think this would still be an incredible story for our democracy, of people getting involved. We should want people to get involved in the policy making that affect all Americans. And if it were the only the story to tell, I could just end right here and we could pass out the t-shirts and go to dinner. Uh, but it's not the only story to tell. Just as we saw in the Arab Spring when political protests in one Middle Eastern country helped to spark political protests in another Middle Eastern country, we saw the same thing happening with the SOPA protests. So on February 11, 2012, the SOPA protests from the United States helped to spark protests in the European Union. In fact, in all 27 countries of the European Union, in over 250 cities involving over 100,000 people who not only protested online, but protested marching on the streets in the middle of winter in freezing temperatures. And what were they protesting? 
were protesting something called ACTA, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, which was a trade agreement pushed by the United States, European Union, and also Japan and other developed countries to ratchet up enforcement against online piracy and counterfeit materials. So for those of you who know the TRIPS agreement of the WTO, this is a so-called TRIPS plus agreement. It's supposed to go up higher standards of enforcement above and beyond the TRIPS agreement. And even though ACTA was quite different from SOPA, for instance, it did not have the controversial domain name blocking feature of SOPA, people, the public, readily associated the two together because of the fear that both would lead to greater internet policing by governments and by corporations that would have collateral damage and cause censorship of the internet. So people were fighting against internet policing and fighting in for the notion of internet freedom. And you can see this starkly on this image from Cluj Napoca, one of the cities where there were thousands of people who protested. So on this sign, the sign reads, SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, making the connection directly between the various bills and trade agreement, as well as TMI, too much information. And this revolution will not be televised, it will of course be tweeted. The other striking image uh, from this photograph is just how cold it is. There are, there's a mountain of snow behind this young woman, and she's draped in a scarf and winter gear. And yet thousands of people protest on the streets against ACTA, chanting no to ACTA. If you go to Google image search and type in ACTA protests, you can see really dramatic photos of all the protests, or mo many of the protests in the 250 cities. Or better yet, if you do that same search on YouTube, you can see live video footage of many of the cities in the protests with people chanting no to ACTA and jumping up and down in you know, very cold temperatures. So when we put these two protests together, the one in the United States and the one in the European Union, I think this is an incredible story of civic engagement twice over, or maybe 27 times over, given all the countries of the European Union. And it, just as in the case of the protests in the United States, the protests in the European Union had never happened before, where there was a demonstration concerted in all 27 countries involving so many people. And this helped to lead to the European Union Parliament voting down ACTA by an overwhelming, overwhelming vote of 478 against and only 39 in favor, even though the European Union Commission had actually signed this agreement. It was so remarkable what the protests did. So what are the lessons that we can draw from all of these protests of 2012? Well, I think the first lesson is a simple lesson. And that lesson is don't mess with the internet. The internet community has been by and large a sleeping giant, but this was really the first time when millions of people felt their internet freedoms were threatened and did something about it. And they were fighting for internet freedom and that's why they got involved, the threat of internet censorship. The second lesson is that we the people can make a difference. And I know this sounds a little bit cliche, but I think it's actually true. And I think it's actually validated by what happened in 2012. People were fighting for this notion of a free and open internet. That's a concept that is not being defined by courts, at least not yet. It's certainly not being defined by our Congress, which can't even agree on a budget. It's being defined by people. So as the late Aaron Swartz said in one of his last public speeches before his untimely death, we won this fight because everyone made themselves the hero of their own story. Everyone took it as their job to save this crucial freedom, this freedom of the internet. They did whatever they could think of to do. They didn't stop to ask anyone for permission. The senators were right. The internet really is out of control. Now some skeptics out there maybe look at all these protests and ask, what do people really know? So most of the millions of people who got involved were not lawyers, were not law students. So many of the students that I teach probably know more about copyright law and know more about First Amendment law than the vast majority of people who got involved. So there is actually one theory out there that what, what happened was that a, a lot of people were just misinformed. And actually the sponsor of the version of SOPA in the Senate Senator Leahy actually said this the day after the blackout, explaining the blackout as a, 
product of a, loss, a lot of false information going on out there. Stephanie Moore, the Democratic Chief Counsel on the House Judiciary Committee, even put it in starker terms. The internet response was orchestrated by misinformation. Netizens did poison the well. Netizens meaning citizens of the internet poisoned the well. And I'm guessing that I'm in a, in a, being here in San Francisco, I'm in a crowd of people who heart the internet, so to speak. But I would just ask you, before you dismiss this view out of hand, realize that it actually is reminiscent of a view that goes back to the founding of this country. So James Madison, in this famous essay, Who are the best keepers of the people's liberty? engage in a kind of faux debate between the leading parties of the day. So the anti-Republican or the Federalist party said this, according to Madison's view, the people are stupid, suspicious, licentious. They cannot safely trust themselves. They should think of nothing but obedience, leaving the care of their liberties to their wiser rulers. So the people are misinformed. It goes back to the framing of uh, the founding of our country. And I think that's what you see in Leahy's and Moore's remarks about how this all happened, how the protests happened. But there's another view out there as well, and it's the, called the popular constitutional view. And under this view, the people's view of the Constitution reigns supreme. Even above and beyond the Supreme Court, the people should win out. And Madison, speaking again in this debate, says for the Republican side, the people themselves are the best protectors of their liberties, the sacred trust can be nowhere so safe as in the hands most interested in preserving it. Now my view is the popular constitutional view better explains what happened in the SOPA debate as well as the ACTA debate in the European Union. That the people's view of free speech, as they interpreted in the context of this notion of the free and open internet, reigns supreme. And it reigns supreme even above and beyond sort of highly technical legal memos prepared by our top First Amendment attorneys. Floyd Abrams arguing that there was no problem with SOPA under the First Amendment. Harvard law professor Lawrence Tribe arguing there was a First Amendment violation created by SOPA or a great likelihood. These memos, highly technical legal memos, did not carry the popular debate. Nor did, for that matter, the Supreme Court jurisprudence on the First Amendment under which we have to analyze whether we apply intermediate level of scrutiny to a law or strict scrutiny. That wasn't the test that people were applying. Instead, what people were applying to SOPA and ACTA was a more common sense understanding of free speech. And under that test, SOPA flunked. It created too much likelihood of collateral damage and censorship of legitimate speech. Now, lesson number three is the power of social media. And uh, to be honest, there are so many stories to tell about how social media help people to uh, organize and wage these protests. Uh, I don't even cover the half of them in my book. And for today's talk, I can only talk about a few of them or a couple. Uh, but I encourage you to take a look at the book and also uh, any other articles online about it because there are dramatic things that many people did uh, to get involved in this debate, as Aaron Swartz said. So I'll just give you some of my favorite examples of the use of social media here. Now my first example is probably my favorite example. It involves Ryan Birchie, who is a 21-year-old college student at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And at the time of the SOPA debate, he said he had never been political in his life. You could barely get this guy to vote, is the way that he put it. But when he read something about SOPA online, he was really disturbed because he thought it was a threat to the internet. So he decided for the first time in his life to get involved. And in his youthful kind of exuberance, he decided to take it straight to the top, the words that he used, meaning President Obama. So he decides to write a petition to President Obama, and luckily we have a president who has set up a system called We the People, in which anybody can write in, and if they get a certain number of signatures, the president will respond to you. And back then, it was only 25,000 signatures. So Birchie writes, SOPA is a censorship law that would end the internet as we know it. He posts a link to his petition on Reddit. He gets 25,000 signatures in no time, and it gets over 50,000 in the month, period. And then somebody else writes a similar petition, and it also gets 50,000. So President Obama has to respond to these petitions. And then some people only wonder, well, what is this 21-year-old going to do to influence President Obama? Well, it turns out Obama finally comes out 
against SOPA on January 14, 2012, a few days before the Wikipedia blackout. And Obama had been in sort of a difficult position because he had strong support from Hollywood and strong support from Silicon Valley, and they both you know, disagreed about SOPA. Hollywood obviously supported SOPA strongly, Silicon Valley strongly opposed it, so Obama was in a difficult position, but he finally comes out against SOPA. And here's what he says in part, uh, we must guard against the risk of online censorship, echoing the, some of the same themes that Birchie had mentioned in his petition, and some of the same themes that the opposition to SOPA had been raising from the start of the opposition back in October of 2011. So Birchie and others, I think, helped to influence this debate that you know, eventually got the president to uh, adopt their view. Example number two on the power of social media, let's go back to Massachusetts, and this time on the western end where we have four internet activists, Tiffany Chang, Holmes, Wilson, Nick Revel, and Dean Jansen, who have come together to form a nonprofit called Fight for the Future. And this new nonprofit is set up specifically to do one thing, to stop SOPA. That's how much they feared SOPA and what it would do to the internet. The first campaign for Fight for the Future was called Free Bieber. And I hate to disappoint some of you in the room, Bieber is not actually behind Mars. Uh, but the strategy of Fight for the Future was to make more concrete, make more real, who the collateral damage would be if SOPA were to be enacted. And one of the provisions of SOPA criminalized unauthorized streaming of copyrighted content of a value of $1,000 or more, if done willfully. And I don't know if people realize how Bieber got discovered at the age of 12. He basically got discovered by singing other people's copyrighted music, presumably without you know, licenses, without permission, and he uploaded them onto YouTube for others to watch, and then sure enough, he did get discovered that way. So the goal of Fight for the Future in this campaign was to have people sign a petition against it called the Free Bieber, uh, on the Free Bieber website, and they got over 200,000 signatures in a, a one week period for an unknown nonprofit that had just launched. How did they do this? They used social media. So a big boost to their Free Beaver campaign was provided by a YouTuber known as Sexy Phil. And Sexy Phil basically comments on the news, but he routinely gets over one million views to all of his videos. And this one almost got two million views. He kind of has a Jimmy Fallon style and comedic uh, commentary. But part of this video was serious and it had a link to their Free Beaver petition and it all, he also, Sexy Phil also talked about SOPA and criticized it as a threat to internet freedoms. So that provided a huge boost to the Free Beaver petition. But the biggest boost to the petition was provided by Justin Bieber himself who said, this bill is ridiculous. So he was actually asked this question by a DJ in DC and only in D.C. would you ask Bieber about a copyright bill, but sure enough, they did. And Bieber also said the bill's sponsor should be locked up and put away in handcuffs. And then the mainstream media picked this up because Bieber got involved, and then the blogosphere went nuts. Bieber fan websites were all talking about you know, Bieber's comments, and that brought in the so-called believers into this debate, and they were likely against the SOPA bill because Bieber was against at least part of it as well. So this was an incredible story or incredible victory, first victory for the Fight for the Future group, which had just started and received over 200,000 signatures in one week. Okay, so what next? Those are three lessons we can draw from the 2012 protest. What next? Where do we go from here? Well, some of the internet nonprofits, including Fight for the Future, have organized an Internet Defense League. And this Internet Defense League is basically to make people more vigilant, more ready for the next threat to Internet freedoms. Uh, people were taken surprised by the aggressiveness of the SOPA bill as well as the ACTA trade agreement. So people were trying to avoid that from happening again. So you can sign up for their listserv and they will send you this cat symbol, kind of a riff on the bat symbol to signal the uh, alarm about any threat to internet freedom. And you can propagate the cat symbol on your website through a piece of code they'll send you. And they just did this recently for the controversy over the NSA surveillance. 
and organized a protest in D.C. that involved over 2,000 people. Now, in Congress, there are others fighting for the Internet as well. Uh, the two of the leaders who fought against SOPA, Senator Ron Wyden and Representative Daryl Issa, have proposed what's called an Internet Bill of Rights in Congress. And they did so on the day of the blackout. So the Internet Bill of Rights contains 10 enumerated rights, including the right to a free and uncensored Internet and the right to an open Internet. And you can actually go on their website called keepthewebopen.com and provide comments to make this bill better through crowdsourcing. And hopefully one day it'll get passed. But you know, quite frankly, it's far off from you know, serious consideration, but at least it's a start of the conversation about protecting internet freedoms. I think you can tell from what I've just said, though, that in terms of internet freedoms, everything is still up for grabs. Despite the incredible successes of the protests of 2012, how millions of people got involved in the United States and millions of people got involved in the European Union, all of those protests were purely defensive to stop a bad bill or to stop a bad trade agreement from being enacted. None of it was translated into a court decision recognizing internet freedom or an act of a legislature, a Congress, European Union, Parliament, recognizing greater protections for internet freedoms. So everything really is still up for grabs. And I need only mention three letters, NSA, surveilling our emails as we speak. But I think this presents us with a profound challenge and an incredible opportunity, and I speak especially to any students in the room uh, who are here. You will be our future leaders of internet policy and policies in other areas that affect individual rights. You can be like Paul Revere and the Midnight Riders and sound the alarm about threats to freedoms that we all hold dear and join in in a common effort in the cause of freedom. And I know some of you may not be into politics. I'm not really into politics either. But you don't have to be into politics to be aware of politics, to be aware of, for instance, the cat symbol, or other warning signs like the Wikipedia blackout, or things that you read in the blogosphere or in newspapers. And maybe if there's an issue that really disturbs you, you might get involved, and perhaps it's for the first time in your life, by calling your member of Congress email your member of Congress, or even better yet, calling your member of Congress and melting the phone line as Representative Zill Lofgren advised the opposition to SOPA. And there may be skeptics out there, and if this is eventually posted on the internet, people who watch this talk later on, who still question why get involved in this fight for the future of the internet. And why did so many millions of people get involved in the fight of 2012? Well, to answer this question, I was reminded of, of a passage in the book about Paul Revere, in which Professor Fisher describes an interview of a captain in the American militia, Captain Levy Preston. And in that interview, Preston was asked a similar question. Why did you fight in the American Revolution? And he was asked this years after the revolution was over. And they asked him first, was it the notorious Stamp Act of Britain, the, the act of Britain that required all printed material in America to be printed on special paper that had a stamp, essentially a tax on printing. And Captain Preston said, I don't have any stamps. So they asked him again, well, was the tea tax, the tax on tea that led to the Boston Tea Party, in which Paul Revere and others, other Americans dumped tea into the Boston Harbor? And Captain Preston said, I don't like tea. So he's a man of very few words, obviously. Uh, and then they asked him again, well, was it the writings of, on individual liberty by John Locke and other leading political theorists of the day? And Captain Preston said, I don't know those guys. So they asked, well, what was it, Captain Preston? What led you to the battlefield and led you to fight? And here's what Captain Preston said. We had always governed ourselves in America, and we had always meant to. The British didn't mean we should, and that's why we fought. And that's why I fought. And I think if you take that message, that helps to explain what happened in the protests of 2012, why people were fighting for this notion of freedom of the internet. People were born with an internet that was free of government control and free of corporate control. The internet that we were born with looked like this, a decentralized network, a Revere-style network. 
and people were fighting against a change of the internet architecture or governance to be that top-down model, the model controlled by a government or governments, the model controlled by a corporation or corporations. So people were fighting for the internet freedom that they were born with, similar to what Captain Levy said in terms of, Captain Preston said, in terms of how America was born. Now, I'll end on this note, and I hope to end on a note of optimism, and I'm sort of an optimist by nature. If you think about what happened in 2012, and how we the people can make a difference, and how the power of this social media gives us incredible tools to fight for the freedoms that we believe in, this fight for the future of the internet is really ours to win. We just need to make it happen. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have time for a few questions. Before we do, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, that's the website. On the, my website, you can get a free PDF of the book, which is licensed under Creative Commons license. There's also an ebook version on Amazon for only 99 cents. And then finally, the print edition will be out this month. And if you check back on that website, the print edition, uh, it'll be announced on that uh, website. And then the last thing is, feel free to take a t-shirt on your way out uh, if you have to leave early. Okay, so I'll open it up for any questions. Yes, sir. Um, so I'm one of the organizers of Restore the Fork, which is an NSA spy, anti-NSA spying group. Um, so I was just, uh, the way I come to this is from the perspective of what can we learn from the soap open book experience. And the thing, there's, this, there's the narrative of grassroots social media organizing, and then there's the narrative of there are these massive consumer brands on the internet, Mozilla, Wikipedia, uh, Google, right. and those consumer right. brands are, have incredible power. And the reason that the dial was moved on SCOPA is the sleeping giants that woke up was not social media, the sleeping giants that woke up were these consumer brands that suddenly saw their businesses being threatened and actually decide to use the power that they have. So what is your point of view on which narrative has more power? Well, I think if we go back to the lesson of Paul Revere and Paul Revere's ride, I think you cannot dismiss the importance of, let's say, Google getting involved. They were certainly a part of the big protest on January 18th. But to sort of characterize it as being driven by big business, I think, is inaccurate. Because there was another powerful force in, you know, sort of brought on by the people, including, I would characterize Wikipedia as being a part of the people, because Wikipedia is just run by a bunch of volunteers who voted in favor of shutting down the site. So to go back to this image of the decentralized network, I think you're quite right to emphasize certain communities were organized by technology such as, you know, uh, Reddit, Google, uh, Mozilla, etc. Uh, so they can be, you know, some of these circles. But a lot of the decisions that were made were not made initially by sort of corporate executives. So, for instance, I'll just give you an example. Uh, Google did not join the first protest. It was back on November 16th. So we're almost at that date, the two-year anniversary of that date. Called it was actually it was called American Censorship Day, and Google was asked to join, and they did it for obvious reasons, I think, and it's tough for a business to sort of shut down, but that's what they wanted. And uh, they, they reluctantly kind of joined at the end in January 18th to get them involved. Facebook did not join the protest. Uh, and it actually might, might have helped because Facebook helped people organize and spread the message of what's going on, but Facebook didn't join the protest either. Uh, so that's not to say that the business, big businesses, the big tech businesses, weren't important players in the protests and in the debate, but it would be incorrect to then, uh, if you allow you know, some concession about their participation, to somehow characterize this as a Silicon Valley versus Hollywood battle. It was much more than that, much more than that, to go back to kind of Aaron Swartz's quote. I think he sort of accurately captures what happened that day. And to speak just briefly about the NSA uh, issue, uh, since you're working on it, uh, it's a tough issue. 
it's a tough issue, and I've thought about this because I've been asked repeatedly about this issue. Uh, people wondering, well, why isn't there a protest that, that as big about the NSA surveillance? You know, I think part of it is that the notion of internet privacy is very ethereal. It's very abstract. And when people say the NSA has been surveilling your emails and contact information, uh, there is no actual disclosure of that. Your emails are not being broadcast to others. So people, it's harder for people to feel an invasion of privacy at that moment versus, let's say, if you know, we were strip searched and somebody videotaped that and that were broadcast on the internet, then, I mean, the, the invasion of privacy will be very palpable. So I think that in part that is one of the problems of this privacy invasion. Uh, it's harder for people to feel that impact as I think people did feel with respect to SOPA with the fear that the, their favorite websites would be taken down. So the Free Beaver campaign was great at doing that and there were other examples that people used uh, to sort of convey the possibility that it could be you know, the site that you're been, you've been going to mistakenly taken down, even if it's for a temporary period of time. That was something like internet censorship was something that was just so easy for people to grasp. And I think it's a little bit more challenging with internet privacy where you have, you know, a lot of people on social media where, you know, privacy is kind of a nebulous notion where people are posting things on Facebook, for instance, and not necessarily that concerned about privacy. Even though I think if, if pressed, they, they would be something really sort of uh, personal were disclosed. And I had a quick comment to that. People were fearing change here, and with the uh, light on the NSA, it's, it's, uh, they were fearing change, they were fearing something like that. With the NSA, it's already it's happening. It's happening. It's not like there's some change moment that everyone's fearing. Yes. It's, it's something that's happening. It's like, how do we react to it? And it's harder to feel, I think. It's, it's happening right now, and people are thinking, oh, well, I can't tell, and also I, I think there, there are, there's a certain segment of the population that uh, believes that the national security, fighting the war on terror, it's worth some certain trade-off with privacy in a way that maybe doesn't neatly cash out in the context of speech and censorship. People are less like, you know, willing to engage in sort of bargaining of uh, speech on, on, the, on the internet. But that's at least one theory I have in terms of why isn't it more vocal right now? 